Ireland is in the middle of a battle against organised crime gangs. I would say number one priority is organised crime, and if it's not checked, it'll grow and grow and grow. Today, organised crime has brazenly come out of the shadows. By eroding the rule of law in large parts of our society, we are threatening the rule of law in the whole of society. In Limerick, criminals openly flex their muscles and flaunt their power. Cities depend on people being able to go out and feel safe in public. You can't have a thriving urban environment with high crime and fear. The gangland godfathers rule the roost over whole neighborhoods. And few citizens step out of line. If there was any 12 jurors asked to adjudicate upon a gangland trial, a certain section of them uh, would shirk their duty because of fear. Law and order is struggling to overcome the tyranny of the local mafiosi. The tight organizations uh, with the commitment to each other not to give evidence against each other. The kind of omerta thing that you get in organized crime in the United States. The use of the gun, uh, the use of intimidation, the attempts to take over sections of communities. The deliberate execution of citizens who get in their way marks a new phase in the evolution of organized crime in Ireland. The attempt to dominate a whole city. Of all the particular people we've put away for long stretches, I have never seen conscience, no remorse. The normal rules of humanity or society does not apply to those particular people. Welcome to Badfellas. This is the face of organized crime in Ireland today, Wayne Dundon. This is the force behind Limerick's most notorious street gang, the McCarthy Dundons. Their assault on anyone who crosses them has compelled the police to change tactics and the state to change the laws in order to meet the challenge posed by Wayne and his band of brothers. The dead man has been named locally as David Noonan in his early 20s. 19 year old Aidan Kelly from Moirassa in Limerick City. This fatal shooting happened at the busy Thomond Gate area of Limerick. The Ruthless crime gangs have laid siege to Limerick for over a decade. Dozens have lost their lives, hundreds have been maimed, and whole neighbourhoods have been uprooted in the murderous feuds that have been waged to establish control of the drugs trade in the city and the wider region. The plight of one family stands out in the story of Limerick Gangland, the Collins family. The night gang boss Wayne Dundon walked into Steve Collins' pub and confronted his adopted son Ryan was the start of a nightmare. Wayne Dundon came to the front door with his young sister Annabelle Dundon. Uh, she was only 14 at the time and Ryan refused her entry. Wayne Dundon was used to getting his way. When Steve Collins' son Ryan refused to serve his sister Annabelle, the gangster believed he'd lost respect. Wayne Dundon took offence to this, put his finger up to Ryan and told him, fuck you, you're dead. Uh, he went away, 29 minutes later, somebody came back and walked into the lounge, into the bar, sought out Ryan, shot him in the knee, tried to escape through the bar, couldn't get out, came back while Ryan was lying on the ground, shot him again in the groin. The attempted murder of Steve Collins' son Ryan was not an isolated incident. Limerick has been plagued by violent gangs for years. The city proportionately has one of the highest rates of homicide by firearms in Western Europe. Proportionately speaking, about five times as many gun killings occur in Ireland than do in comparable countries such as England and Wales or in Scotland. Firearms possession and firearms discharge are quite high in Limerick. There, there is a legitimate concern there, so Limerick 
does seem to differ to a certain extent from Cork and fr from Galway. It's an intersection of urban deprivation, drugs trade, and also an expression of masculinity on the parts of the individuals involved, because this is certainly a, a male crime. Limerick was once a city synonymous not with crime, but with religious piety, social order, and poverty. Throughout the 60s, I can recall that at the start of circuit court sittings, the county registrar would stand up and uh, he'd present the judge with a pair of white gloves. And that was to signify that there was no indictable crime in the city or county of Limerick. And that just go on term after term. I arrived as a young guard in Limerick at the end of 1971. There was very, very little crime, certainly no, no serious crime occurred in Limerick in the, in the, certainly in the late 60s and into the mid 70s. Limerick's biggest social problem was not crime, but housing. Many parts of the old city were dilapidated and overcrowded. The corporation's response was to build 2,000 houses in a place called South Hill, far from the centre of town. The houses were built, but without any facilities of any kind. Uh, there were no churches, no schools, no shops, no pubs, uh, nothing. And uh, I think very quickly people started to um, uh, amuse themselves by engaging in, in violence and uh, vandalism and uh, things of that kind. And that gradually degenerated into worse. The first thing that, that struck you when you went into the home was Unemployment, absent parent, either father or mother, poor conditions in the houses, bad clothing, no heating, no food in the fridge, uh, no school, no looking for a job. They lived in another world, really, without any support from the general community at large. It was clear by the mid-1970s that it wasn't a success. But notwithstanding that, the uh, then city manager wanted to go ahead and build another similar uh, estate in the other side of the city at Moy Ross. And I remember pleading with him at the time not to do it. Uh, I said, you're going to replicate the problems that we have in South Hill. Uh, and he said to me that he was under pressure from the department to produce numbers of houses. And they didn't seem to be un really interested in anything except numbers. Within a relatively short time, uh, you, you had the South Hill problems replicated there. Limerick is still suffering from the results of that. One of the results was the McCarthy Dundon gang. In May 2005, the leader of the gang, Wayne Dundon, was sentenced to 10 years in prison for his threat to kill Ryan Lee. But a court later reduced this to seven. The following month, our premises broken into and set alight. I mean, what you have here is just the front. The back is completely gutted, destroyed. You know, our dreams destroyed, everything destroyed. The start of a horrendous couple of years for us now. In Limerick, the genesis of gangland can be traced back to places like South Hill. Vandalism and antisocial behaviour was the curse of the ghettos built by Limerick Corporation. To sort out the vandals, the local authority turned to a career criminal called Mikey Kelly. The city is still suffering from the fallout of that decision. I'd just like to say I can speak on behalf of my family that we are totally crime free. I mean, Mikey Kelly was running a protection racket and the agents of the state were hiring him and paying him to continue with the protection racket. And when Mikey Kelly protected your, your, your factory, he never assigned security guards to it. He just put the word out and put a big notice up, this premises are, are being protected by Mikey Kelly. It was a protection racket and the state shouldn't have been involved in it. But from their perspective, you know, criminal damage was reduced to zero as soon as the, the Kelly sign appeared on the gate. I was violent, 
I was a violent criminal. I expressed myself in a violent way. I rang the then manager and I said I was surprised that he was employing this individual. And he said he had no option. Uh, that this fellow was, as he put it, effective. When he caught some young fella throwing stones through a window, uh, he beat him up and broke his leg. That was regarded, unfortunately, as a, an effective way of dealing with the vandalism problem. By making Mikey Kelly a bit respectable, the corporation had sent out a toxic signal. In Limerick, crime pays. It enabled the people who he attracted in to, to, to operate freely and to become quite proficient in crime so that they could form the basis of membership of future gangs. So he was a very, very significant figure in the evolution of organised crime here in the city. There's no doubt about that. Like all crime bosses, Mikey Kelly was a parasite. The city council and private companies were coughing up. So too were the ordinary people of South Hill. Every week, Mikey went from door to door collecting a pound from every house. That was the price for keeping Mikey Kelly off your back. Coming to you from the Brooklyn waterfront in New York City, this is Mafia Talk Radio. Cut the cards and hide your wallets. This is Mafia Talk Radio. You think you know, but you don't really know. Other cities have been doing business with bad fellas for a long time. New York. For years, it was the epicenter of organized crime in America. The home of extortion, racketeering, and City Hall doing business with mobsters. Criminal enterprises thriving on a pervasive climate of fear. I've seen it here in Yonkers, and I've seen it in New York City, my combined 30 plus years of law enforcement, that, that organized crime, especially what we're dealing with now in the 21st century of, of violent street gangs, are decimating neighborhoods throughout the country. And if you look at some neighborhoods, some poor neighborhoods, uh, in some cases, that's viewed as the only alternative for youth, uh, where maybe they didn't stay in school, maybe they weren't provided with a good education, maybe they didn't have uh, a strong parent or parents at home. And then they decided to go into a group, a street gang, an organized crime group, and they've gone on and now probably wind up either in jail or unfortunately dead. You can't have a thriving urban environment with high crime and fear. Cities depend on people being able to go out and feel safe in public. Fighting fear as well as actual crime is essential. The capacity to terrify is an essential and universal feature of organized crime. From the streets of Limerick to downtown Washington, D.C., there is a common denominator, fear. Fear is an absolute key uh, for organized crime groups. They capitalize on uh, regular citizens uh, when it's keeping legitimate businesses or law-abiding families out of the community. The, the impact is widespread and it's felt for years. The, the impact can absolutely lead to uh, folks that have to live scared or, lo or look over their shoulders for the rest of their lives. Steve Collins knows what it's like to live looking over his shoulder. His testimony had helped convict gang boss Wayne Dundon. And for that offense, a price was put on his head. A threat came out from prison. A letter came out to say that I was to be murdered for 75,000 euros. And a guy called John McNamara, who they called Pitchfork, was to be murdered for 75,000 euros. They mistook uh, Shane Gagan for Pitchfork, and they shot him. So a mistaken identity, and, and an innocent man was murdered. The victim was visiting friends here in the estate last night to watch the Ireland-Canada rugby match, and was returning home when he was shot in what they now believe was a case of mistaken identity. You get situations like that, and obviously, quite justifiably, everybody is outraged when that happens. But most of the murders are, are intra-gang murders. Uh, you know, people not handing over the money they collected when they sold some drugs, people giving information to the guards who are being shot for that reason, and so on and so forth. And it's quite vicious. 
In the 70s, the drugs trade became a feature of life in Limerick. Huge money, very lucrative business. Obviously, the more money that could be made, the more ruthless people became. Uh, as each generation succeeds the other, the new generation is more violent than the one that preceded it. No, their grandfathers were petty criminals. A bit of breaking and entering, the odd assault. And, you know, as it came down through the generations, the level of crime they were uh, involved in became more serious. But the X factor was drugs. Because it's drugs that provide the finances to make them serious criminals. It's drugs that provide the finance uh, to get them into organized crime. It's drugs that provide the interconnectors uh, to make them national organizations rather than limerick organizations and it's drugs that provide the solder to get them involved you know in the gun trade across europe for years serious crime in limerick was the occupation of two outlaw families the keens led by veteran gangster christy Keane, and his violent younger brother kieran their sidekicks were the ryans led by killer eddie ryan Eddie Ryan was envious of all the loot the Keens were grossing from Limerick's drug trade, and he wanted more. The Keens said no. Eddie then tried to kill Christy, but his gun jammed. Two weeks later, Kieran Keane came back looking for revenge. Garthy estimate the armed men fired up to 15 shots, killing Eddie Ryan and seriously injuring two women sitting close to him. A customer asked, where do you hit Eddie? Everywhere, he gasped. That was his last word. When they were leaving the pub, they turned back at the pub and they discharged eight shots through the window of that pub. The pub was full of people on a Saturday night and they made their escape. The gunning down of Eddie Ryan was the first fusillade in a feud that has claimed too many lives. The vendetta has overshadowed life in Limerick and continues to this day. The body count now stands at 22. They absolutely hate each other. There have been so many people killed on each side now that it seems to be the most natural reaction. Uh, that you, you know, make sure the person on the other side pays the ultimate price because they've done that to you. Just as the Keen Ryan War was unleashed back in 2000, a branch of another Limerick crime family entered the fray when the Dundons returned home from England. The Dundon brothers, John, Desi, Jer, and headman Wayne. Wayne Dundon claims he doesn't smoke, drink, or take drugs. He takes pleasure inflicting pain. He started his criminal career specializing in robbing and beating defenseless elderly people in England. On one occasion, he pummeled a pensioner in a wheelchair during a robbery. After serving four years in an English jail, he was deported in 2000 because the Home Office considered him a dangerous felon. Today, he's graduated to the leadership of the McCarthy Dundon Gang, one of Ireland's leading narco-terror outfits. It's always very important to remember that the first and most important cause of uh, crime is the decision of the criminal to commit it. The idea that criminals lack self-esteem is preposterous. The problem is not that they lack self-esteem. The problem is that they have far too much of it. They haven't been humiliated nearly enough. The Dundon brothers would fan the flames of the feud between the Keynes and the Ryans. James McCarthy, Desi Dundon and Anthony McCarthy, all allegedly loyal to the Ryan family. You fucking muppets! the McCarthy Dundon gang. They would pose as allies to both factions. All the while, they plotted to step over the bodies of their rivals on their way to dominance of the Limerick underworld and terrify the Republic's third largest city. Within Limerick City, they are one of the most violent gangs that I or my investigators, our colleagues, have, in, have encountered over the last number of years. The Dundon uh, McCarthy gang was structured almost like a, a mafia. The ferocity of the crimes that were committed by the gang 
instilled a lot of fear in their own gang members, number one, in the wider community, and certainly in the, in the, in the gangs opposing them. It seems that they have set the benchmark and the others have followed. If they are violent, the others must be more violent. And if the others are more violent, they must be more violent again. And it is not simply the, the killing of somebody, but the maiming and the torturing of somebody in the most horrific circumstances. It all goes back to the structure, really, of the gang. Uh, it's, it's based on the family and the dynamics that goes with the family and the ability of those gangs to, to recruit into their lower ranks impressionable young men whom they'll send out to do their bidding and who will do it voluntarily. You're looking at the Dunn and gang like, and these are just four brothers. They're four Muppets as far as I'm concerned, like, you know, and I don't know why they get the respect they do. They were able to form this gang of, of lunatics and uh, that would do their, their deed, like, and, and that's, that's really, and they've got, got from strength to strength with that. When, when the Dundons are away, locked away, nothing happens in the city. I mean, it's not just coincidence, you know, it's, it's a fact. You know, I mean, you look back on it to, to all, all the previous times that they've come out of prison, there's been mayhem, you know. It's only when he's around, he causes this kind of shit around the, around the city, like. These are just some of the firearms Gardaí have taken off the criminals and the dissident Republicans that are arming them. Pump-action shotguns, Webley and automatic handguns, revolvers, grenades, and a machine pistol with silencer. The bad fellas are getting younger in Limerick. The killers are often kids who should be in school. Typically now, people who are committing shootings at the behest of the drug dealers can be as young as 15, 16, and 17. In a recent case, uh, a courier was used to convey guns away from the scene of a crime. Uh, he was 13 years of age. Yeah, people fight turf wars and they, by doing so, they become king of the castle and they're, um, they feel big. When the gang bosses feel big, everybody else must kowtow and feel small. So few people grasp the elementary point, which is that the primary victims of crime are the poor, not the rich. It's like a, a prison without orders. They're actually more or less enclosed in their houses. They're afraid to go out, except at times permitted by the psychopathic people who act as the warders in the sense that they're imposing their kind of order. They can't escape from these estates. They have a kind of life sentence to them. I mean, they can, of course, go out on day release. At night, they're locked into their houses by the disorder outside. And they have uh, the prison governor, who is the, uh, the local psychopath or psychopath's family, who imposes his will, and from which there is no appeal. The concept of enemy is used in criminology to explain crime in that individuals who do not feel a connection to the society, who do not feel part of the norms and rules, will not feel the need to adhere to those regulations, will not feel a part of the, of the community. Enemy is most common in societies that are undergoing rapid change or that are undergoing a, a rapid breakdown in social cohesion. In Limerick, the principal criminal agents corroding social cohesion are the McCarthy Dundon gang. The Dundon McCarthy gang, they had a far broader agenda altogether. Their agenda certainly was to dominate the drug trade, wipe out all other gangs, but also to take on society. Part of the Dundon grand plan is to take over neighborhoods and build Dundonville. Areas like Ballinacorra and Moy Ross are seen as territories to be conquered and occupied. The Dundons want to consolidate and secure their criminal base. To do that, they have been making offers to locals that cannot be refused. When 
tenant purchase of local authority dwellings became general. Gangs of people who were very wealthy as a result of their activities in the drugs trade uh, started to buy up these houses. And um, so often uh, they cleared out the residence of other houses nearby. In Limerick, compulsory purchase on terms decreed by the gang bosses is a method of tightening the screws on an area. Members of the gang will be assigned the house because if they're not, the house may well be burned out or may be vandalised. Over time, the gang establishes itself in an area and by the sheer size of it and the sheer reputation of that gang, it really intimidates everybody in that neighbourhood. The defiance of the Collins family was a running sore for the McCarthy Dundon gang. Their gangland enemies watched and waited and came out of the shadows on the morning of April the 9th, 2009, Holy Thursday. On that morning, uh, we, it was like any other morning came in here. I was setting up the business in the pub and Roy went into the casino to set up the casino. And about a half an hour later, I got a call from the barman to say, like, somebody was bleeding next door in the casino. Went in and I seen Roy just in the corner, bent down on his hunkers, and he couldn't breathe. He lifted himself up and I could see the bullet on the ground. Like, and I just couldn't believe that, what I was looking at. And uh, he kept on repeating to me that he couldn't breathe, he couldn't get his breath. He just held on to me and he told me he loved me. He loved his mother. Roy Collins lost his fight for life a few hours later. This was a salutary crime. The calculated murder of a young man related to a witness who had stood up to a crime boss. This was an attack on every citizen of the state. He was murdered clearly to send a signal uh, to the rest of the community in Limerick that if anybody uh, came forward and gave evidence or helped the uh, criminal trials uh, that they were going to be taken out as well. It's as much a threat to the security of the state as the subversives were back in the 70s. Evil. There's no other word for it. With the persecution of the Collins family, the Badfellas of Limerick had put down a chilling marker. This is our town. Get in our way at your peril. It was time for the state to strike back. Organized crime gangs are deeply entrenched in Limerick. They have enriched themselves by flooding the streets with drugs, by extorting money from local businesses, and by trafficking in firearms and explosives. In many parts of town, the gangs call the shots. As a Limerick man, I have to be very concerned about the way the city has degenerated. I represented it for a very long time, and um, I could see this beginning to happen. Um, and I regard it, if you like, as one of the, my failures in life, that I wasn't able to stop it. There seems to be no end to the torment of the Collins family. There was a brave dog down here at the level crossing to hold a big man. I mean, that's, that's what the guardy told me. It was evident that it must have been for me. 64 people have been violently killed in Limerick since the millennium. The Gardaí have solved 54 of those cases. Many of the foot soldiers who have done the dirty work for their godfathers are now in jail. But there is no shortage of recruits. The appeal of the gangster lifestyle is irresistible to some teenagers. They can put their arms, their arms around a 12-year-old and they can show him, bring him in the car and show him a bling life and they think that they, these guys then are going to show them a brighter future like, and they can be influenced so easily. Like. I'm, not, I'm not waiting for, for John Dundon, Jer Dundon or, or Wayne Dundon to walk up that car park and do anything to me because they're cowards, you know. They'll hide behind these kids and get them to do their work like. But, that's what you're looking at, is, is, is young kids now starting to go, go around with glocks and uh, coked up to the eyes 
and, and I mean, I've seen him. I've seen him there, like, as young as 10, on drugs. In Limerick, the teenage foot soldiers of the major gangs have been programmed to hate. But the state of war that exists between the McCarthy Dundons, the Keens, the Colopies, and their affiliates may not last forever. At the moment, there are a number of disparate groups uh, that are not controlled by anybody, uh, that are fighting amongst themselves. Uh, but if that ever stops and somebody decides, as they did in America back in uh, the good old days, uh, and decides to organize uh, the groups and get them to cooperate with one another, then we've got a very, very serious problem. In the good old days in America, organized crime syndicates like the Mafia gnawed away at the Big Apple. Although the setting couldn't be more different, there are striking parallels between the predicament of Limerick and what happened in New York. In the 80s, violent drug gangs had turned New York into a city of fear. Over 2,000 people were being murdered every year. Many New Yorkers were resigned to their fate. Their city was the most exciting and the most dangerous in America. To save New York, there would have to be a change. New York, I would say at the time, was, was being described by many experts as a dying city. Uh, crime was, was rampant. Uh, the homicide rate uh, from the time of the crack epidemic in the mid 80s, going through the late 80s and into the early 90s, homicides were in the four digits. New Yorkers for decades feared to walk the streets alone. The streets were the domain of predators. Most cars had these ridiculous little signs posted in their dashboard and on their front windows saying, uh, everything's been stolen already, please don't break in. You basically, the criminals ruled the day and citizens were on their knees begging for uh, exemption from the criminal run. In 1994, there was a radical change at the top of the New York Police Department when Bill Bratton was appointed commissioner. Bratton had been the chief of the city's transport police and had dramatically lowered crime on the subway. His mission was to bring order to the chaos above ground. Bratton's policy was called the broken windows approach. Problems in a neighborhood stem very often from quality of life issues. If there's a group of disorderly males on a corner drinking and engaging in, in antisocial behavior, uh, if we don't address that, that, that problem will not only increase, but it will lead to other problems in the neighborhood. So now we know that the gang members hanging out on a certain corner must be addressed at 6 o'clock at night because they're going to do something later at 12 o'clock at night and it will probably be a more serious crime then. And when we go to community meetings, the complaint we get is not about a stabbing down the block or uh, somebody who uh, who robs somebody in an armed robbery situation very often the, the the complaint we get is the noisy group of men on a corner the loud radio the public drinking the public intoxication the public urination in the street we address those things if we find that the the larger issues don't occur because we've addressed the smaller issues the key to the success of this new strategy was accountability Precinct captains were responsible for crime detection in their districts, and their commanders were keeping count. They would call in precinct commanders. These are the commanders of local policing districts. And they would ruthlessly grill them about the crime that was happening within their precincts. And if that commander didn't have not only a rigorous and minutely detailed understanding of his crime problems, but more importantly, a strategy for solving those problems, he faced demotion and the end of his career. This was a revolutionary concept. It was basically importing private sector ideas of management accountability into a public sector agency. We went from a reactive police philosophy where basically uh, when someone called 911, we sent a radio car, they handled the problem. Uh, we still do that, of course, but now we've shifted to a more...
proactive philosophy, a more assertive philosophy, where we're targeting the problems at the right time, at the right location, for the right reason. Limerick is not New York. It is, however, man for man, Ireland's most policed city. But the mood is still ominous. In some parts of Limerick, people are frightened to call the police. Scared to be seen talking to anyone in a uniform. Reluctant to take the stand, no matter how trivial or serious the crime. Before we get up here to Mally Park, if we're here in the Bennett House up here. Where you have intimidation, widespread intimidation. Um, people fear uh, to report crimes. They fear to be witnesses. And they're right, because what happens is the group of criminal people feel that they, that they actually have impunity. But ultimately, nothing can touch them. seems to be the stock and trade of Vilderman criminals that they will uh, intimidate the vulnerable witnesses. I have about 12 weeks of uh, criminal trials every year. In every one of those weeks there will be a case where witnesses will be frightened, will be intimidated. But certainly they had no compunction in attacking the organs of the state. Prison officers intimidated, guards intimidated business people to allow them into their premises to do drug dealing. The state solicitor, his offices were burned out on a number of occasions. I've had personal difficulties um, in relation to carrying out the job um, in the past. I mean, I've had my offices burnt down. It took 12 months to rebuild the office. Uh, I had a second attempt at burning down my office. I've had other uh, security problems uh, from time to time. In Limerick, the major crime gangs have carved out their strongholds, forbidding fortresses where they dominate. Citadels you enter at your own risk. I just buried my son, and we were followed by the Dunn and McCarthy gang down Childers Road, and we pulled in. I was talking to Stephen, they came up alongside and threatened Stephen that they were going to kill Stephen. We lost a head, we followed them, and we were lured into a, a trap where they, they had a gang waiting down in Weston. They came over the walls, battens, bottles, chains, and we were lucky to get away because there was a, a level crossing just in front of us and we drove away and it was just closing. And the guy seeing what was happening and opened it for us, they let us through. If he hadn't have we probably would have been killed that day. In Limerick, the gangsters have tried to suck the city dry and ruin its reputation. In New York, the criminals know better. Here, the police have reclaimed the city, house by house, street by street, precinct by precinct. The gangs have been banished to the shadows. Homicide has dropped in the last 20 years by 80%. New York has been transformed. Today, it's the safest big city in America, a magnet for millions of tourists. The transformation of New York was most impressive in the city's poorest neighborhoods like Harlem, central Brooklyn, east New York. It meant that poor people in Harlem, senior citizens, could walk to the store, shop at night, cash their social security checks, and not worry about the drug dealers hanging out on the corner. In New York, we believe it's better to have a police commander sweating bullets than to have actual bullets flying on the streets killing civilians. And that's the bargain we've made. To get away from the flying bullets in Limerick, Steve Collins was offered a hard bargain by the Garda Witness Protection Program. A new life in North America for him and his family, but at a price. The surrender of everything he built up and all that he stood for. We would bring you over, we would take you there, we would get you a place to stay. 
You change your name. You couldn't tell anyone at home who you were or what, what your new name is. You can't work as an electrician because you weren't an electrician. It's just, it would blow your cover. You can't work in a bar because you've done that already and this is the way that they would find you. So you had to go to do something completely different. I asked, like what? And he said, well, because training was a carpenter. I wasn't told what was going to happen. I just took it that there was something in place to protect us and look after us. I want a witness protection program in place that suits people like me for coming forward because there's nothing there for decent people. At the minute, I feel it only benefits criminals that want to come out of gangs. Wayne Dundon is one criminal who'd love to see the back of Steve Collins. They've taken my son now and he's, and he's very close to us now and, and we have the comfort of that that I can go and visit his grave every day if I want. They're not going to run me out of town now. Not now. The people of Limerick are sick of this. They're sick of the, the city being blighted by these scumbags because it's a great city for most of the people that live here. They, they were looking for an opportunity to stand up and say like that, we've enough of this, you know, and please help us. Because if you haven't got witnesses, you haven't got a democracy, the whole thing breaks down. We need the laws that propose to be put into place now and we can reclaim our city. The time for talking now is over. You can't legislate by emotion, but here was a family who came forward, did their duty, and look what they got, the consequence, their lives ruined. Uh, not just the life of, of Steve Collins and his wife, but their entire family ruined uh, by this particular instance where they did their duty. So if the, if the state didn't respond to that, if the Oireachtas didn't respond to that, it would be a very sad day for Ireland. The murder of Roy Collins, just like the assassination of Veronica Guerin 14 years earlier, compelled the government to act. It is now an offence to direct organised crime. Now, for the first time, the Gardaí have the powers to subject crime gangs to intense covert surveillance and wiretaps. Now, for the first time, that evidence can be produced in court to put the bad fellas away. The gangland crime legislation uh, not only has put huge pressure on these people, but has given the guards the tools to take them off the street. And not just the old Egypt, who was given a few quid or might have been high as a kite and shot a particular person, but the person who orchestrated that, the people directing, that's the whole point of this legislation. James Dillon was the impressionable young drug addict who pulled the trigger on Roy Collins. He's now serving life for the murder and his loyalty to the mob. After 26 Garda interviews and a visit from his grandfather, he admitted to Garda, I shot Roy Collins. If you look at the record of the criminal justice system in Limerick, and particularly the guards, it has been very, very successful, much more successful than anywhere else in the country. In terms of eliminating the gangs and preventing the crime uh, for, from happening in the first instance, there's a lot more work to be done there. Organised crime is now a nationwide scourge. But in Limerick, Garda tactics are producing results. The crime bosses who call the shots are feeling the heat. The intense police pressure is paying off. Shooting incidents are down from over 100 in 2007 to just 14 in 2010. Limerick is by no means a lost cause. I think it, it is torn in the toilet a bit now, and if it didn't, I wouldn't think twice about asking the people to come back on the street again and to do it all over again. And I think if we'd done that, it would be massive because people now have got confidence since the last march. And I think it will be stronger, it will be bigger, and it will be more in the face of the government to, to get things changed. Because there's still a lot to change. There's still a lot of laws that could be brought in to change things, to make things safe for our families. The first cases under the new anti-gang legislation are due in court in early 2011. The underworld will be watching and waiting on the verdicts. In America, similar laws have been around for years, but it took a new vision of policing and a change of heart at the top of City Hall to bring the crime rate in New York down to World War II levels. 
There's no reason why any city in Ireland cannot crack down on the crime problems that its citizens view as most uh, significant, whether it's graffiti being out of control, whether it's shoplifting, whether it's disorder or violent crime. It's, it's just a question of the police believing that they have the possibility and the obligation to solve crime through information management, analysis, and, and accountability. It absolutely has to be an aggressive approach to tackle organized crime. Increased use of physical surveillance and electronic surveillance, wiretapping laws, increased use of human sources, they have to aggressively be used if there's going to be any success at uh, putting an end to organized crime groups. It may be that a strategy that's, that's designed for Limerick may not be the strategy for Cork City or for Dublin. Uh, that's where the police executives come in and the, and the police on the street come in. They have to tailor, they have to know their community and know what their community wants and the concerns of their community and then tailor their strategy accordingly. Uh, in your face policing uh, is I guess a good way to put it, but whose face are you getting into? You're getting into a bad guy's face. You're not necessarily getting into the good people. The vast majority of people in all these neighborhoods are good, solid, hardworking people that are trying to raise their families. I think in New York is a clear example of uh, how uh, a pretty tough regime uh, from a criminal justice point of view is put in place, uh, allied to the resources to try and help ordinary communities. We'll carry out an equipment check now. The only way it will be dealt is ordinary policing, blanket policing, and of course, uh, in your face policing against these people. Reds three and four rendezvous at Formal Point Bravo at 1200 hours. There certainly is a real challenge when we're trying to deal with organized crime in balancing the rights, the interests, the concerns of a legitimately uh, worried community with the individual that has been investigated or maybe that has been tried before the courts. It's a very precarious balance, but eroding rights won't necessarily make the communities any safer. The only thing that the, uh, the psychopath would understand is a force stronger than himself. And in this case, it would have to be the state, if you like, the police. You know, it's easy for people to criticize in, you know, the leafy suburbs that all this is draconian. Um, tell that to the people like Steve Collins and, and families like that, Shane Gagan's family. And that's why the state has to react in a proportionate way, but act it has to do. You are only talking about 30 or 40 families, uh, and uh, that's perhaps 150, 200 people. Uh, you can't let 75 or 80,000 people be held up to ransom by them. I think that, uh, you know, the guards now are uh, coming to realize that they're taking them on. And I think that the law now uh, is an awful lot better uh, in terms of dealing with them than it was in the past. Good is going to come out of evil, you know, because it was an evil thing that happened to us. And, and some good will come out of it because people will benefit from these new laws, you know. And, and that's, that's why I'm proud of the fact that, that Roy's name is associated with those laws and, and that people going forward will see the benefits of it and, and remember them, you know. And if they remember them, well, then that's all I ever set out to do at the start, was that he wouldn't just be another, another number. In the 1960s, Sarah Era brought the gun onto the Irish crime scene and murdered Garda Richard Fallon. We had really crossed the Rubicon because now we are into the era of the gun. The 1970s saw the provisional IRA emerge to wage a war that left a legacy of extortion, racketeering and murder. We would not have had a descent into organized crime to the extent that we have unfortunately suffered from. And to me, it is inescapable that the direct causal link is the IRA and the application of organization to criminal activity. In the 1980s, the Dunn crime family would get rich on heroin and spawn a succession of ruthless imitators who saw drugs as easy money worth killing for. I would describe the modern day criminal as unpredictable, paranoid and he will go to any length to protect his business. Guns and drugs bring profits and power. 
Now, organized crime has ambitions to control streets and whole neighborhoods, if they can get away with it. I think that we can deal with organized crime. I think it can be dealt with. I believe we're stronger than them. The era of the bad fellas has cast a dark shadow over many lives. The lessons of the last 40 years are clear. If Ireland fails to deal with organized crime, then organized crime will deal with us. <laughs>